Good evening. My name is Eleanor Tornator Mikish. I'm the President and CEO of Caring Kind. It is my absolute pleasure for Caring Kind to be hosting our 37th annual meeting back here at the Time Center. First and foremost, I want to thank our dedicated board led by Chairs Jeff Jones and Linda Lagorga. Jeff, stand up. If my entire board can stand up. For their relentless commitment to Alzheimer's and dementia caregiving support. Also, I want to take a few minutes to thank my amazing staff who worked so hard on making sure all the details go smoothly for this event and many other events, particularly Ed, Michelle, Andrea, Courtney, Stephanie Argon, Stephanie Shivers, Julia, Julie, Linda, Dominic, and Jed. At Caring Kind, we strive to be your trusted partner. We are often the first call after the initial diagnosis and the last call when somebody has passed to hold your hand. We work with a, with a family member an average of eight years. I checked that out for this meeting. I was just curious how long we work with a family. Eight years. That sounds like family. What you will hear tonight as part of the panel is our strategy to help the living with the disease and family care partners using technology, AI, medical advancement, supportive services, and more. I've been in the field for over 24 years. Many of you know my story. I started at Caring Kind after graduate school in 1994. Uh, came back three years ago, still amazed at the work that we do. And the last two years, I can say, and I have chills by saying, that there is hope and progress. Many for what you'll hear this evening. But first, let me introduce our next speaker, Diane Tai. She is the managing director of the Milken Institute, Future of Aging, where she oversees strategic direction and operations for its focus on healthy longevity, financial wellness, and leads its alliance to improve dementia care. Caring Kind is honored to have her here with us this evening. Diane? Thank you so much, Eleonora. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here with you for your annual meeting. Um, and just a quick note about the Milken Institute for those of you who may not be familiar. We're a global nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank that focuses on accelerating measurable progress on the path to a meaningful life. It's really that phrase accelerating measurable progress that I feel really describes what we're seeing today in the Alzheimer's space. Um, so I joined the Institute about three years ago for an opportunity to lead a new initiative that was getting off the ground called the Alliance to Improve Dementia Care. And uh, just to see the progress we've made has been really incredible as we really were trying to address this fragmented and very complex journey that people living with dementia or at risk for dementia and their caregivers are experiencing. We're now up to over 130 members. We meet monthly and uh, Caring Kind is one of our members and we represent folks from all of the key sectors of society. Our focus is on improving earlier detection and diagnosis, building workforce and systems capacity, and scaling comprehensive dementia care models and dementia care payment models. And as part of my capacity now as head of our center, we're also very focused on family caregiving. And we're doing a new project uh, with employers to really recognize that working family caregivers need benefits and supports from their employers. And if, if anyone is interested in participating in our research and a convening that we're doing in DC, please come and talk to me because I would welcome you to join us. The title for tonight's event, New Horizons in Alzheimer's Care, I've been really focusing on that word optimism, because really for the first time in a very long time, the palpable sense of optimism is truly there. As we look at the diagnostics, the biomarkers, the drug therapies that are in development out there, and certainly what's in the pipeline, and you're gonna be hearing more of that from our panel this evening. And so it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the panel, Peter Frischhoff, a well-known New York-based healthcare entrepreneur and active health advocate. He is best known as the founder of Medscape in 1995 
and as the godfather of Osmosis, a life sciences learning platform for clinicians in training. Peter, take it away. Thank you, everyone. My friend Alan, who was a uh, backer of Medscape, which will be celebrating its 30th birthday uh, next year. Hard to imagine, mm. 30 years old. But actually, in the introduction, I'm best known as the founder of Medscape and as a bicyclist. <laughs> That's my active health thing. And uh, Alan actually, you know, he published a great, he wrote and published a great book a couple of years ago, uh, two years ago, it was called No Red Lights. And I thought, Alan, was that a book about bicyclists? <laughs> <laughs> Is it about me? <laughs> because I actually always do stop at red lights on my bicycle. I rode a city bike o o over here, so I'm a fan. On our panel here is Dr. Howard uh, Fillett, uh, Gayatri Devi, Stephanie Shivers, my friend Alan, and Joanna Pena Bickley. Uh, Dr. Fillett is a consultant in geriatric medicine and a clinical professor of geriatric medicine and palliative care and neuroscience at the Icon School of Medicine, Mount Sinai, and co-founder and chief science officer of the Alzheimer's Drug Discovery Foundation. And Dr. Devi is director of Park Avenue Neurology, a clinical professor of neurology and psychiatry at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell, an attending physician at Lenox Hill Hospital right here in New York City. Stephanie Shivers is the chief innovation officer at Caring Kind. We all know her, who was awarded a three-year project from the Administration on Community Living which brought a continuum of evidence-based and evidence-informed services to caring kind. My friend Alan is chairman and co-founder of Primetown, Primetime Partners. Um, I've known Alan since 1975 <clears throat> when he was in venture capital. He backed a lot of famous magazines, New York Magazine and many, many others. He turned me down flat for a magazine publishing company <laughs> in 1975. He said, I only invest in people who have failed at least once. <laughs> he was right, and in 1982, he <clears throat> backed a medical publishing company, which was the birthplace of Medscape in 1995. So we go back a long, long time. Uh, Joanna Pena Bickley uh, is founder and CEO of Vibes AI which is a, and the host of the Design by Podcast, which if for anybody who loves music and the sonorous healing of, of <clears throat> musical notes, listen to her podcast. It's very interesting. So there will be questions um, at the end of the session, but I'm going to save everybody a little bit of time by asking you all to address three points in your discussion. The first is, how do you measure the effectiveness of therapy? The second is, how do you share uh, data in therapy? And the third is, is AI going to save us all from? <laughs> so without further ado, Dr. Howard. Thank you. As far as measuring the effectiveness of therapy, um, we, uh, the, the foundation supported the development of uh, the first diagnostic test for Alzheimer's disease, which is a brain scan. And basically what it does is, is it takes a, the dye that Alzheimer used in 1906 to look under the microscope and see the plaques and tangles for the first time. And an investigator in Penn had an idea back in 2000. He called me up and said, I have a crazy idea. I can't get any money for it. I said, what's that? He said, I want to take the same dye that Alzheimer used in 1906 and radio label it so it could be used as a PET scan, in a PET scan, and we would inject it into the vein or artery of a patient. It'd go up into the brain and light up a plaque if they were there and tell us the patient had amyloid. And I thought that was a good idea because I knew at that time that very few of my patients wanted to go to autopsy for a definitive <laughs> diagnosis. 
Um, we supported that test uh, for about four years at the University of Pennsylvania in 2005. A biotech company called Avid Radio Pharmaceuticals was spun out with about $7 million in venture capital. Five years later, in 2010, the company was bought by Eli Lilly for $800 million in milestone payments and upfront payments. 2012, it became the first diagnostic test approved by the FDA for Alzheimer's disease. Um, and in 2014, it was reported for the first time that um, by Lilly, the reason they bought it was to accelerate their drug development process, and they were using a monoclonal antibody, much as the ones approved today, to test patients. And they looked at the brain scans of patients who were being enrolled in the trial and found that 30% of those patients had a negative PET scan, which meant, number one, that they didn't have Alzheimer's disease in all likelihood. <clears throat> and number two, they didn't have the target of the drugs that were being used. And so it was clear that one of the reasons why a lot of the previous clinical trials were failed is that even though patients were being enrolled in these clinical trials by presumed experts, the experts were wrong about 30% of the time. So how could you have a positive result if 30% of your population didn't have the disease you were trying to test? Now, the next step was that now this test became the reason for enrolling. In other words, to get into these monoclonal antibodies, these treatments to remove the plaques from the brain, remove the amyloid from the brain today. To get in, you had to have that PET scan as a positive or a spinal tap. <clears throat> and uh, ultimately, to make a long story short, the first drug ever approved um, in history for as a disease-modifying agent was a drug called uh, aducanumab. And it was based on what's called an accelerated approval, which meant that the FDA concluded, based on the trial results, which showed that these antibodies completely removed the plaques in somewhere between 6 and 18 months from the brains of people with Alzheimer's disease. So for the first time, we could actually test the amyloid hypothesis, which was if you remove the plaques from the brain, would there be clinical benefit? And there was. Um, so. The FDA recognized that and said that there was a reasonable expectation, this is sort of regulatory language, that if using this brain scan, if you could remove the plaques, there was a reasonable expectation that patients would have a slower rate of decline in their disease. And so again, history of how things are developed, how long it takes to develop these things, and the value of a test which, uh, in my practice, um, I can come, somebody comes into the office um, they have a memory problem. I do a test. I suspect they have Alzheimer's. I can write a prescription for them to go down the block to the radiology office, get the test, and pretty much by the next day, I can tell them with about 90% certainty if they have Alzheimer's disease or not. And the last thing I'll say, if I may, is that the test costs about $8,000, and it's pretty reliable, but it is a PET scan. You do have to get injected and go to the radiology office. And now we have blood tests. The PET scan becomes the gold standard. We're developing blood tests that correlate with the gold standard of the brain scan. And they're just coming out on the market. And I think the revolution that we're going to see in the coming months to year is that this blood tests, which correlate with the brain scans, are going to be on the market. So it's going to revolutionize the way we diagnose patients and also the way we screen patients for clinical trials, because the blood test is just a few hundred dollars. It's a blood test, which we're all used to. It's very reliable and valid. And so when they come to the office, I can tell them, you know, I can just draw the blood, tell them if they have Alzheimer's. Or if we're screening patients for clinical trials, that's a major cost. $200 million of the $400 million it costs to do a phase three trial is finding the patients. And if we have to do thousands of brain scans, it's very expensive. If we can use blood tests, it'll be a lot easier to screen patients to go into trials. And the last thing I'll say, if I may, Please. is that these tests have revolutionized prevention. Mm. Because now we know, using these tests, that the brain scans start turning positive in people about 20 years before they develop symptoms. So we can go out screen people either by the blood test or the brain scans, find people that have preclinical disease, and get them into prevention trials, which has already been done, actually, and I think is going to be the future of Alzheimer's care. Well, the goal is to prevent the onset of symptoms uh, in a person's lifetime, and I think that's achievable. That's an incredibly informative <laughs> and, a, and encouraging uh, answer. So thanks very much. But you forgot the third thing about sharing the data and the news about this progress. 
Well, the, we work, we have a partnership with Gates Ventures, Bill Gates' venture capital firm. Uh, and uh, through that, and the Gates Ventures themselves, they've developed something called the Alzheimer's Disease Data Initiative. And it's a repository of all sorts of data that they're going to be gathering. So there will be data sharing. It'll be anonymized because we don't want to get into revealing individual patients. But there'll be thousands and thousands of people with Alzheimer's disease and all of their data going into this repository that'll be run by Gates Ventures. And we're partnering with them for, uh, about that. And I forgot the third question, actually. <laughs> no, that was it. You, oh, did, okay. it. you, you did it. Okay. You did, did it. How do, how do we? Uh, how do we measure success? And, uh, and the data sharing was the, and then AI was actually, a, a, but yeah. they sort of alluded to that. We were talking about AI. I'm, I'm not sure but, I understand what artificial intelligence is, but, um, <laughs> but I, under, I understand it's being used in clinical, it's gonna be used in clinical practice, I'm told, you, so. You know, one, one of the interesting things, I've always been a great believer that this combination of life sciences and neurobiology and technology is is the is the key and it's very interesting to me that the many of the pioneers in artificial intelligence are actually neurobiologists and have identified healthcare as a primary focus of of their of their work so but was there something else you wanted to add as part of your presentation mm -hmm. um I don't think so, actually, right? Okay, okay. great. Dr. Devi. And um, in Alzheimer's as a subset of that, and I have to say that the horizon has changed dramatically, dramatically, not just for diagnosing Alzheimer's, but also for treating Alzheimer's, and also particularly important for preventing Alzheimer's and other dementias. And I think that the trajectory has changed from a multitude of different directions. First of all, the amount of drugs that are available to treat this condition, not just the cholinesterase inhibitors, which are drugs that increase the brain levels of acetylcholine, but also certain other drugs that are helpful to prevent the nerve cells from dying. And then the third category of drugs are drugs that change the levels of, of um, the amyloid that's present in the, between the brain cells, as well as possibly affect the amount of tangles that are present inside the brain cells. And then finally, drugs that may ameliorate the inflammatory response, which a lot of people now feel is also involved in uh, what ultimately causes Alzheimer's. It's not just tangles, it's not just the plaques, but it's also inflammation. So there are three aspects that we need to prevent um, in order to be able to help to treat Alzheimer's disease. Um, and I think that area has really changed so that now I have patients in my practice who've been diagnosed using cerebrospinal fluid testing, which was available back in 2006 and five, for definitively diagnosing Alzheimer's by checking cerebrospinal fluid levels of amyloid plaque and tau, and using that, making a diagnosis of Alzheimer's even before we had the PET scans for amyloid and the PET scans for tau, which are not yet available, much less expensive than, um, than looking at amyloid scans. Um, and using those tests, we've been able to identify and treat patients who are stable as long as 15 years after diagnosis. So it's important to realize what I've learned in these 30 years is that yes, you can treat the condition. Early on, I was taught that if you had someone who got better, then probably they don't have Alzheimer's, they have something else. I've since learned that each of us brings our own particular brain to this condition. We have our brain reserve, we have our cognitive reserve, and therefore we have a spectrum in terms of our having Alzheimer's. And different parts of the brain gets affected. So artificial intelligence is one way for us to be able to categorize patients into different classes. Um, so there are people who have um, certain areas of the brain more affected than other areas. And depending on the brain area affected, the trajectory of their illness will also be much more aggressive or less aggressive. So one person's Alzheimer's is that person's Alzheimer's. 
because one person's brain is that person's brain. And I think we have this nihilism, which is thankfully disappearing, mm -hmm. in terms of how we view people with Alzheimer's. So we are all afraid we're all going to end up in that portion, that small portion that's visible to us, in terms of being in a nursing home and not being able to speak. But I'm here to say that, that that's only a small portion. Most of us exist in communities and are practicing um, in various professions and are parents and grandparents and um, valuable members of society. And the, the worst disservice we could do to ourselves is to not be able to, to take care of it, to maintain our personhood as we get older with a condition like Alzheimer's. Um, and then in terms of sharing diagnosis, which was your question, and in terms of judging efficacy, I think you, it's very hard. I mean, we all know that day to day, some days I feel extremely stupid, and some days I feel marginally smart. So it's very hard to really assess, to self-assess our own abilities. So it's really important to have objective measures of our cognition. I think it's important for all of us to get cognitive baselines and then use that to measure ourselves as we get older. If we can have baseline bone density scans, we should have baseline cognitive scans. And then we should be able to measure efficacy from treatment based on how we change over time with these scans. Um, and obviously, blood markers will also be helpful. I've been very lucky in terms of treating patients with Alzheimer's with the monoclonal antibodies and to be able to actually observe that there's disappearance of the amyloid plaques in the brain in such patients, and some of them with observable clinical benefit. Um, so I think there's a lot of hope for the future in terms of treating patients with Alzheimer's, um, not just with available medications, but also um, in terms of diagnosing and managing care. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Stephanie Shivers. Well, as the service provider in the group, I will say that if you're going to measure something and share something, you have to have something to measure and share. And I'm delighted to actually say, Karen Kind, we have launched in the past two years 16 new programs and services, which is why our staff looks beleaguered and tired. Um, and as far as how do we go about measuring them and sharing that, we're sharing that in opportunities like this. And we measure them by really looking at what do people say before they start a program? What do people say after they start the program? Is there actually a cognitive change? Is there a change in depression, loneliness, um, uh, cognition, confidence, caregiver, sense of mastery, all of those things we look at and measure. And with 19 new programs, you can imagine that's quite a, a robust thing to do for a not-for-profit community-based organization and not a research institute. And so I have to give a kudos to, to our staff who are involved in collecting that information and sharing it. And how do we share it? We ask people, did it work? And if it does, they tell their friends. So you are actually our best, our, our best disseminators of, of quality information by actually asking the people who, are, who are, are taking advantage of the programs and who are accessing them. And, and do they feel like it's actually making a difference in their everyday lives? Um, but 16 programs is, is a pretty um, exciting place for us to be. And you know, the title of this, of this talk is, you know, we said hope and optimism, I think, or, or innovation and optimism. And I think we're, you know, as, as Gayatri said, you know, we're at a, a, at a pivotal point in our history here for so many different reasons as um, have already been shared. You know, we have the first disease-modifying treatments we have comprehensive dementia care models that have been proven effective that are being recognized and showcased. Um, the Milken Institute has been very helpful to do that. And we have, um, you know, for the first time, we're actually looking at payment, payment reform for services and support, which is a very exciting place to be. And so, you know, while I'm sure there are people in this room who will not um, realize the full benefit 
of where we are and the sacrifices that they have made and the lived experience that they've had will certainly shape the future, but it will shape the future and it is shaping the future and we're seeing evidence of that. And so it's a very exciting, exciting place to be. And I think, you know, being a part of Care and Kind is a real privilege because we have 45 years of history as being leaders in, in this field and we are continuing to be on mission to be leaders in supports and services as we move forward. And I think that, you know, how we're going to also, um, is AI the ultimately going to change things? It's certainly going to make a difference and it's certainly escalating the, um, the, the pace of scientific advancement and I think advancement of our society as a whole. And so I think that's an exciting prospect for us to see where I, AI will take us. Um, but I think that this panel is an incredibly exciting um, demonstration of where we are in our history. You know, you, you don't go to a, a meeting about Alzheimer's and have you know, someone from AI and venture capital and services and supports and physicians and um, clinical trial research funders and you know the head of medical knowledge and coalescer of, of Medscape all in one place. And I think that actually demonstrates we're at a different place now. We're collaborating differently and that that's actually going to, to escalate our, the, our advances and our solutions. And that's a very exciting place to be. And a piece of that is our families, and particularly people who are living with dementia. And just like Gayatri was saying, you know, having, having people living with dementia and, and Alzheimer's and other forms of cognitive change actually rising up to advocate for their own needs and um, to be seen as valued partners and collaborators in the process and being welcomed with a seat, a real seat at the table to help escalate the solutions that are for them, that's a wonderful place to be. And I think ultimately that will be the key to how we disseminate and showcase the best information forward is when, when, when the people who are impacted by this disease are really the ones who are leading the change. That's great, Stephanie. Yeah, thanks very much. And we're gonna wanna hear more about the reimbursement and the money part later, because that does really drive a lot of the, the work. And uh, my friend Alan is next. And when we talk about measurement and sharing and AI, he can certainly talk to those points. You know, when I listen to this panel and I think about measuring and, you know, Peter Drucker had this term, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And Mayor Bloomberg was very fond of, of stating that over and over again as he introduced reforms that we now all take for granted, like the 311 system and things of, and bike share, speaking of bicycling. And when I think about other areas of medicine where we measure things like pain, this very soft, you know, do you heard on a scale of one to 10 and one person's seven is another person's two and the measurement is almost meaningless. And like Alan Patrikoff, you know, as a venture capitalist, they look to have a return on investment in five years and he started investing in my companies in 1982 and in the 1990s, he said, Peter, how long is it gonna take and I said, well, Alan, everything in medicine takes two to four times as long as everything else. So where are you on this scale of venture investing on a scale of one to 10? And he said, you know, for you, Peter, it's like dividing by zero. I don't even know the answer to, the, <laughs> to that. But thanks to the information we have on this panel, we actually, you know, in the world of Alzheimer's, we've done a much better job than we have in the world of pain and really coming up with objective measures for both diagnosis and, and treatment. And that is a really huge advance because if you don't know how to measure it, 
You don't know how to deal with it, and that's a really fundamental step. So, Alan Patrickoff. What a strange introduction. <laughs> Are you I, in pain, Alan? I, th I, th I think I'm in the wrong place. I mean, I, I can't answer any of the things that uh, Peter brought up or that Howard and the other part of the panel uh, answered. I, 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 I specifically, uh, I'm an investor. A venture investor, and I invest in companies that relate to the field we're here tonight, but we specifically don't get involved in biologics, pharmaceuticals, or anything that requires FDA approval. So I can't give you any insights into any of the things we're talked about. Uh, I formed a firm, well, let me give you a little bit of background. I got involved with Caring Kind because my wife uh, uh, had Alzheimer's for 12 years before she passed away three years ago. So I went through every stage from the early stage and early onset to uh, the final uh, days. And through every, uh, I tried everything. I went to, uh, tried several clinical trials. I, I, I did whatever anyone caring about their spouse would do. And uh, that's how I got introduced to Caring Kind because they were a great support to me and uh, whether it was uh, helping programs for my wife or, uh, being a source for caregivers, or uh, being a, I, I was a member of a support group, an active member for several years. Uh, so uh, I'm very fond of this organization, and that's how they stuck me on this panel. Uh, <laughs> uh, but let me tell you what I do, because it, it does relate to this. I, I formed a firm three and a half years ago, and for those who don't know, I've been in the venture business since 1970, which Peter kind of referred to, uh, and uh, have formed three firms in this business. The most recent one I formed three and a half years ago at age 85. I'll be 90 this year. Uh, I'm probably one of the oldest. Uh, Peter can tell you about all the other things that I do that defy the uh, age limits. Uh, but uh, uh, in addition to which, I got married three months ago. My wife's in the audience. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, I formed a firm three and a half years ago because I saw, uh, I had read a lot and I had watched what happened to my wife and I uh, increasingly was aware of the need for caregiving, the need for support services, the need for uh, uh, new technologies that served older people. And I became educated in the fact that the fastest growing part of the population is people over 60, and there'll be more people over 60 in 2030 than there will be under 18. And uh, also the fact that kids that are born today, half of them will live to be over 100. So we're gonna have a, a, a gradually aging population. And so with the benefits of Gayatri and uh, Caring Kind and Howard and everybody else, people are gonna live longer some of them, unfortunately, with diseases, but they're gonna live longer, and when you live longer, you're gonna need products and services and technologies and experiences to take care of you and to support you during that period. And I recognized that that was a hole in the market, and so I formed a firm called Primetime Partners with a partner uh, uh, who had also been very focused in this area because we both had been on the board of Ariana Huffington's company, uh, Thrive Global, which is involved in wellness. And so we've now, at prime time, uh, uh, so we, uh, we feel that uh, uh, people like on this, on this panel are gonna provide the uh, people who are gonna be using the services that we're investing in, whether it's caregiving or telemedicine, and I could give you the whole list of things. We've done 30, made 35 investments. But more importantly, we've looked at over 1,600 investments in the last three and a half years, which is, gives you an idea of what's happening. When we started, there was one firm uh, comparable to ours. Today, there are five or six. Uh, people are gradually recognizing that longevity is a, is a hot topic aging, wellness, and that all of us have to be concerned about this. The cover of Business Week a month ago was the big words longevity. The Co cover of The Economist was longevity. Even Vanity Fair ran an article. Uh, this weekend, the Wall, Wall Street Journal had an article in the magazine section about loneliness. Uh, and all of these things are the things that are, uh, we have to be concerned with as our population is living longer. And uh, many of them healthily, by the way. But uh, uh, we're 
we're investing in those things that are going to make their life better uh, as they live longer. So uh, I, I could go through a whole litany of all the different services and, uh, and products that we're involved in, but uh, basically they're designed to make life better as you live longer. I, let, let me add one, la one last thing about it, because th we do have some companies that have a specific uh, relationship to Alzheimer's. One, one uh, there is a, uh, I mentioned loneliness, which loneliness leads to depression, and uh, also uh, there are ways of determining uh, deterioration in someone's uh, mental capacity by, uh, by their voice, by uh, video, and we have backed a couple of companies which are uh, specifically focused on whether it's through the phone or whether it's through the video to uh, gradually monitoring people over a period of time to seeing that decline and perhaps intervene earlier and provide services that will uh, slow things down. I, I, I don't necessarily agree with everybody that we're on the horizon of preventing, but I do think slowing things down is a, is a noble endeavor, and uh, I think that's more on the horizon than I personally don't see, and I'm not a scientist, the uh, curing of Alzheimer's. I think that we're, in my lifetime, I hope we're going to see it become less and less uh, severe and hopefully at some point declining. Well, thank you. Um, in addition to picking very good parents, Alan's very disciplined and clearly knows how to enjoy the pleasures of life. And it's been a pleasure to get to know him um, over these many, many years. So thanks very much. Uh, Joanna Pena Bickley. Yes, so I'll be your resident AI expert um, with 15 years of having been at a uh, IBM Watson and known as the mother of cognitive experience design. And so you talked a little bit about um, the idea around technology and cognition. And so this is my area of expertise. Um, and whether it was my work um, early days of applying artificial intelligence um, to help physicians make diagnosis in the areas of cancer, one of the areas that was really clear was that we all have a sense of um, need for cognitive help. And so a lot of the work that I've done over the years has been in designing applications and programs that enable humans to make better and wiser decisions with the assistance of AI. In my years at um, Alexa devices, so how many of you in the audience have Alexa, an Alexa device? So as a stockholder in Amazon, thank you very, very much. Um, but also as somebody who genuinely, when we came into the role of bringing artificial intelligence into people's homes, we saw this as an assistive device that should be able to help people of all ages. And what we found and what we, some of the unintended consequences would actually, the uh, people who used it the most were people who were aging in place. Um, people who didn't necessarily feel comfortable texting to communicate. Um, and so it was kind of upon that revelation that we began to see, wow, we have some biomarkers in here um, for everything from voice recognition um, to computer vision that we could begin to service our cl uh, customers much better. And so when I founded Vibes AI, it was on two premises. The first premise, um, was that um, utilizing these technologies, um, and as Alan talked about, as we are living longer, you know, I expect to live longer. I hope that I live to, uh, to be as, uh, as uh, old as you are, Alan. Um, but what, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. 114, but, but even, that's the... Uh, there is it. So, and knowing that my own children will be living longer, living longer needed to be living longer with dignity. And how do we design dignity into our everyday interactions um, and make that living easier and do so uh, in a way that helps the caregivers in our life lighten the burden? And so I co-founded Vibes AI um, on the premise that we would be working with physicians utilizing artificial intelligence to take the vast amount of data um, to improve diagnostics um, but the second part of this is the ongoing uh, therapies that often help uh, in the everyday of living with dementia and Alzheimer's. 
um, similar to Alan, probably many on this panel, my grandmother um, had Alzheimer's for about 15 years, and this was back in the 80s. And so, so much I think about um, all of the ways that these technologies and these things could have helped her then. And I really keep her kind of front and center of everything that we do and create. And one of the early indicators was that she actually was um, suffered from early hearing loss. And what we know today is that people with early hearing loss are eight times more likely to develop Alzheimer's and dementia. And so in a world where we have the ability to prevent things like that, um, how do we utilize the technology to do that? And Vibes AI is actually very specific in this area, um, working today with Caring Kind, not just as a board member, but uh, working with many on the panel and, and uh, thinking about the new novel ways that we can apply this. But then you asked about sharing, and I think this is an important one. Today, most of the sharing tends to be handled by one or two research things. I actually believe, and our company believes, it needs to be handled by the physicians in the field. And so the sharing of the information, when we detect that maybe you have a, a speech biomarker, right, that that is getting to a clinician, and it's getting so in a way that they can react to it and actually uh, prescribe preventative therapies that help to slow down any of the disease, the disease states today. So in the area of things like hearing health, one of the areas that's very exciting to us is that um, the device you might see behind my ears today is actually a prototype of uh, something actually accidentally just turned on one of my own therapies. Um, <laughs> Um, but this particular device is actually picking up on speech recognition. And so it's picking up on the bio, uh, biomarkers of speech recognition, and I have opted in to send these to an audiologist, right? It's also picking up on a couple of biomarkers for my hearing health. And so at any given time, it's able to tell me how uh, I am doing, whether or not I heard things today that actually impact my hearing health. And by monitoring those things, right, by one, being aware of it, but then the next part becomes around monitoring it, who gets that information? Today, I have that information, but I, as a, a layman, don't necessarily have the ability to react to that. So why wouldn't I be sending that to an audiologist and consulting with them? Why wouldn't I be sending it with a cognitive therapist to be able to do those things? And so, so much of the work that we are doing here today is being able to create platforms that connect us at a lower cost, because so much of the things that we today um, are actually high cost and only available to a small portion of the population. And so Vibes AI is committed to creating technologies that scale and lower the cost of things like diagnosis, the ongoing therapies, the ongoing monitoring, um, and doing so in a way that is cool, because nobody wants to wear a health device. Let's be honest. How many of you actually, if you knew you had uh, some kind of hearing loss, would you want to wear a hearing aid? Yes. Absolutely. Yes? OK. That's lovely. Um, now that you know that you're eight times likely, but the reality is the most of the majority do not. And so we are creating form factors that make it easier to wear it um, and to bring these interventions earlier because the reality is, is just as our eyes go, right, and our 40s, how many of you have glasses? Bunch of you, right? Me too? Okay. Um, so do our ears, but we don't take care of our ears at the same rate and pace that we do our eyes. The same thing could be a cognitive decline. And so the importance of design is actually one that says, might, I, might this be innovative and cool so that I feel good about wearing it and it is doing me some good along the way. And we're embedding these uh, in a way that is you know, keeping our privacy and our security because this is health data, right? At the forefront of everything that we're doing. Okay, I'm gonna have uh, some more to say about sharing. <laughs> in a bit. I, I should say that, as Alan can attest to, you know, when, when people create products, it's often because they're really bothered by something in the world and they, they kind of have a solution to it. And with Medscape, which was 1995, I was really pissed off 
at how, how constrained access to information that clinicians had to the general public. And one of the most radical things that we did in 1995 was that Medscape, where registration was required, but it was open to the public as well as clinicians, so that for the first time, the professional literature was open to everyone who had an internet connection. Didn't matter if you were in Indiana or Indonesia, if you had an internet connection, you could get the information that your clinician was getting. It was very controversial. A lot of healthcare professionals didn't like that. This is a pain, giving consumers access to information. There are a lot of clinicians who don't like direct-to-consumer advertising because this is a nuisance. Patients are going to be coming to us asking for information. Frankly, I don't have a problem with that. I think that it's a good thing. People are hurt by the lack of access to information, not because they have too much of it in medicine. And the informed consumers, the informed patients, are the very best patients. And everyone who's involved in patient care knows that. Consumers aren't generally that afraid of getting bad news or learning about the side effects of medications or therapy. In fact, if they understand them, they make, they're much more compliant and adherent to therapies. So sharing information and the kind of work that Caring Kinds does in pushing out information to both clinicians and consumers is absolutely critical to making progress. And we discussed a little bit before about reimbursement and paying you know, pressure on politicians. That happens when people are aware of deficits in patient care and are advocating for changes to reimbursement policies and, and things like that to help them to help keep them behind. Alan, go ahead. Dave, uh, you know, it's interesting you say that. Uh, I, I assume you, many of you heard this president's speech the other night in which he talked about specifically uh, caring and the, uh, the number of caregivers. I think I, I, I'm going to sprout a number and, you know, people play with numbers, but I, we, we use the number 50 million. There are 50 million people in the country who are taking care of someone in their family or somebody that they're caring for, which are giving up uh, their work time, which has lost productivity, and uh, they uh, have not been compensated. There is now a program underway to compensate them if they're trained and qualified and let family caregivers get compensated. Uh, it's a very important thing. The other thing I was gonna say is what we've learned in the last three and a half years in investing is that it's amazing what the health plans and I mean Aetna, United, Humana, what would they will do to keep people out of the hospital. Uh, I'm overwhelmed every day because they have something called supplemental services, and none of you realize, because no one ever calls their health plan, but if you called your health plan and you have someone who needs caring, you'd be shocked at what they'll do. For example, if you're worried about balance, uh, United Health will give you uh, daily or weekly training and pay for it to help you improve your balance. Why are they doing this? Because if they can keep you from falling, because if you fall, you go to the hospital, you get your hip replaced, you get pneumonia, you get sepsis, and you die. I mean, it's almost that, it's almost that, that sequence happens. And even if you just go to the hospital, that can cost you fifteen dollars or $20,000 from that visit. And so isn't it worth it for them to spend $500 a year to keep you from falling. But it's one of many things that we've learned are available to help compensate people. That's so, a very good fight. So that's actually a very good point, which is, you know, what does what does our insurance carriers do to prevent people from going to the hospital? And one of my pet peeves is that Medicare will only compensate for three months of physical therapy. Mm -hmm. And they will, so you actually have to play this game where you change the diagnosis every three months so the patient mm -hmm. will continue to get PT. Um, so some of the insurance companies do reimburse and others don't. 
Um, and that's really tragic because if, one, if there's one thing we can do just to prevent dementia down the road is we should all get bone density scans mm -hmm. and make sure that if we have low bone densities, then we should prevent it because women are also more likely to have low bone densities. Women are more likely to develop Alzheimer's and women are by far, 80% of caregivers are women and they are the ones who suffer the brunt of being underpaid, overworked, um, and also more susceptible to the disease. Yeah. Okay. So, and then finally, one more thing yeah. in terms of sharing information. It's <clears throat> true that we do need to share information with patients, but one of the areas I have difficulty with, Peter, is now that everybody is able to get their records right away, many of us are getting records from radiology departments that say that they have scans consistent with Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. or, and they get it, and they haven't had a chance to discuss it with their physician, mm -hmm. and they're home alone, and they suddenly see this, and it's the most horrible thing. It's like mm -hmm. suddenly you find out a day after your scan, and you don't have any way of reaching your physician, because sometimes it's very difficult to get the next appointment. So I've made a, a deal with all my radiology providers that they only make the, they only describe the findings without coming up with the interpretation yep. just so that patients aren't confronted with it. They don't mm -hmm. see, they open the, they open the computer and they find this, um, this uh, diagnosis and they're left alone with a tremendous knowledge without a physician or someone guiding them through it. Right. Yeah. The cure, I, of course, to that is more information, not less information, I would say, because what's even worse is that they don't have, that even though that's traumatic, so the way to fix that is to make sure they get more of the right information at the right time, not less of the bad information. I was gonna ask maybe Stephanie to mm -hmm. talk about the guide Gu the, the, the guide model. The guide mm -hmm. model and reimbursement a little, sure. which, came up, which, which came up before. Sure, and th the guide model, it has to do with payment reform, which I mentioned, and I'm happy to have the conversation because I'm an occupational therapist, uh, as well as the work that I do now, and we, you know, insurance won't pay for a tub bench or a shower chair, but we'll pay for the broken hip to the mm. tune of $350,000 and the rehab that goes associated with it. And, and so we, you know, the tide is beginning to turn. I think Medicare Advantage plans are pushing more towards health and well-being, whereas we're, we still have a long way to go in that arena. Is the guide um, model that's a part of the federal right. and legislation? So, so. so the Center for Medicare Services yeah. is finally because of the work that's gone on, basically we've kind of bent their arm to say, we have care models that provide caregiver support, education, resources, navigation, and that if you actually, if we give these services to people, if people have access to these services, it will save the system money in the long run and people's quality of life will go up. Can you describe, they will have better I, life. I, I, you know this better than I do, but one of our companies who I introduced the care, you're, you're partnering, as I understand, in this guide program. But right. Can you, you describe that? Because it, it relates specifically to Alzheimer's. Right. And so the guide program is Medicare's piloting, for the first time, a, an eight-year-long program where they will be reimbursing a small group of, of physicians, health systems, providers, to provide a limited set of services to see if, in fact, it, do, it is effective. Um, the good news of that is that it's on the horizon. You know, the horse is out of the gate, and now we just have to push, continue to push for reimbursement of services. This is not going to provide whole comprehensive payment for everything that people need, but it is a start. And it's a start really on that piece of having access to your clinical team, having access to resources and staff like Karen Kind has, dementia specialists, care navigators who can be available and helpful to people to help them along the journey. This is a, it's, it's not something that people are familiar with. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, our systems are broken. And so this will begin to, the guide model 
by Medicare will begin is exploring what payment looks like. So that's a long trajectory. The, the short better news is that new reimbursement codes have been approved for caregiver education particularly. And yes. so as a therapist, right. I can now, or you know, therapists can provide caregiver education and get reimbursed for it. Right. Which that's that's a new development, right? And that's being implemented this year. That's right. this is good news. And as this is good news. Alan alluded to, it was great to hear President Biden allude to that in the right. State of the Union. You know, we we know we have people's attention on how mm -hmm. critically important this issue is when when we hear that from from our president. You know, you know when the State of the Union speech is made, I I have not been part of it, but I know enough about it. Everybody in the White House, everybody in every cabinet fights for a line in the State of the Union speech. I mean, they really fight. And the fact that that line or two was included is significant because it's competing against everybody else who wanted to put something else in there. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna get to audience questions in a minute. I wanna say just one more thing about sharing and, and a tip uh, for all you clinicians and consumers out there that I got from a, uh, another investor, friend of mine, Wes McCain, who has uh, who's lived with Parkinson's disease for 20 years now, very, very smart man, and he told me about this collapsible bicycle helmet. He's not a bicyclist. The leading cause of deaths among Parkinson's and many other people who live with neurological disease is head trauma. Mm. He wears this helmet and it's prolonged and saved his life several times. Um, so most clinicians don't tell their patients, you know, you really should consider walking around with, a, funny. Bicycle, <laughs> with a folding bicycle helmet. But in his uh, blog, Parkinson's They'll be Parkinson's for sale in the back me. afterwards. Yeah. <laughs> It's interesting, Lucas Samaras, the artist, died this past weekend who had Parkinson and fell and hit his head. Mm. head. Head trauma, all clinicians and, and everyone here knows people who have, who have suffered terribly from these, these injuries. Uh, car crashes, which injure hundreds of thousands of people every year and kill more than 40,000, it's usually head trauma. Uh, sitting in a taxi cab or an Uber without wearing a seat belt in the back, uh, we all know people who have been hurt that way. So, you know, we need to value our heads. So, Dr. Audience questions here. Dr. Fillet, um, we'd like to know more about the FDA's decision to hold an advisory committee meeting on uh, Donamab. Am I pronouncing it correctly? Donanamab. Donanamab. No. Yeah. Donanamab. Donanamab, whatever. It's a tongue twister. Yeah, I actually got interviewed by the press about five times today and several times yesterday about this, so it is a hot subject. Mm -hmm. um, I think the results from Eli Lilly of the Donanamab study are very uh, compelling, actually. And um, it looks like a very positive trial. The drug works. Mm -hmm. And it works better than lecanemab, which is the drug that's on the market today. Um, so I, I, don't, I don't think that I'm worried, or most, most of us in the field are worried, that this uh, request or this planning for an advisory committee late in the game uh, is, is a problem for the approval of the drug. I think that what uh, the FDA is trying to learn from the external advisors is two or three things about the clinical trial that was done that were very innovative by Lilly. One was called, is called the limited dosing schedule. Um, in the trial of Lukembi, people were put on the infusion uh, twice a month for up to 18 months, and there was no stopping rule. For many drugs, we have stopping rules, like in cancer, when the tumor's gone, you stop the drug. Um, in, in this field, it was looking like patients would have to go on these infusions for a long time. What Lilly did was they did the amyloid scan that I talked about earlier to get into the trial. They knew how much plaque there was in the brain. They treated patients over a course of six months, 12 months, and looked at whether the scans turned negative. 
When the scans turned negative, it was assumed that the drug had, the drug had done its job and it had removed the amyloid from the brain and that there was no more work to be done, if you will. And um, so th that, that, that innovation in, in the trial could be translated into clin clinical care to say, okay, you get the drug for six months or when your scan turns ne negative and then we'll, take, we'll stop the drug. That saves not only a lot of burden in terms of people having to get infusions, but also economic costs to individuals on co-pays and costs to society on the cost of these drugs, which are about uh, priced, they've been priced about $26,000 a year just for the cost of the drug, and then maybe another $50,000 for the administrative costs of you know, the site of where the drug is. So I think it's kind of like the way I think of it is that when a patient gets all of their amyloid gone, they kind of go into what might be like a remission. And Lily also looked at, an, in an open label, how long it took to reaccumulate the amyloid in the brain, because for some reason that we're not exactly clear of, uh, Gotcha, Dr. Devi mentioned all of the different pathways that are under investigation now. It's, it's actually quite interesting, but just to finish the thought, um, it takes about four years for patients to recapture how much amyloid they had at the time the drug was stopped. So there's a big window there in terms of people time people don't have to be treated. The other thing that uh, Lily did was when they enrolled people, they looked at the tangles. Mm. And the tangles, amyloid deposition in the brain doesn't correlate with cognition. But the presence of tangles in the brain, there's, there's an old staging system called the BRAC staging system, which measures how much tangles and how they march through the brain. And that correlates with cognition. And with tau imaging, we can see that. And so they, what they did was they measured tau. There you go. Thank you. More audience. More, OK, great. They measured tau at the beginning and enrolled people that had very, they, they, they did not enroll people that had very little tangles in their brain because they thought there wasn't enough to kind of fix there. And they didn't enroll people that had too, so many tangles that they thought there was too much that it might be unfixable. So they really defined the patient population in the trials as people being defined both clinically and with tau imaging. And I think what the FDA wants to know is they want to know more about the stopping rules. Should that be part of the label for the drug? And they want to know more about the tangle measurements by tau imaging, which is only available right now in one county in the United States, mm. which is Los Angeles County, and how that might be in the label. I think most of us don't think that adding tau imaging to the prescription, like as a requirement, will have benefit. We we're generally able to make clinical diagnoses within reason. And then they want to know a little bit more about the safety and efficacy differences in, the, in donanumab versus Lukembi, which is on the market. There's a little bit more safety problems maybe with uh, the new drug, donanumab, but it looks like it's also more efficacious. And 50% of people who took the drug uh, were actually stable at one year, which is incredible. And there have been modeling studies to give you an idea about how much closer we're getting to prevention. There were modeling studies a number of years ago which said that if we could delay the onset of Alzheimer's disease by just five years, we would reduce the number of cases by 50%. And you know, given the kind of parameters that we have around the current drugs, I think that's very possible. And um, one more thing I'll say is that there's a study of prevention uh, it's called the finger study. It was done by one of our board members in Scandinavia. And they looked at how lifestyle intervention, similar to what you mm -hmm. do for your heart, would that have effect on slowing cognitive decline with aging and even slowing cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease. And it was a very positive trial. It's being reproduced now in 60 countries around the world. Mm -hmm. And we're adding on sort of the finger 2.0, which is like heart disease, you do lifestyle management, you manage your diabetes and your hypertension, but then you add a statin because we have the biomarkers and we know it's a risk factor. And so for Alzheimer's disease, we're looking at um, met metabolic disorders with aging like insulin resistance and adding metformin to the finger study mm -hmm. and using imaging to look at the effects of metformin, which is the most widely used anti-aging drug and obviously also for diabetes. So we're entering into a new era. And I think the, um, the way that FDA, the FDA is just trying to learn about how to manage the labels of these new drugs in this new era. Amazing. I have to say, our panel here is so good that most of our pre-panel questions have been answered in, in, their, in their presentations. And metformin, talk about an elderly star. This drug is amazing. It, yeah. COVID, Alzheimer's, diabetes, 
Well, take Ozempic. You know, everybody knows <laughs> Ozempic, right? And yeah. we, we, we funded about five or six years ago up at Columbia a clinical trial of, of metformin for Alzheimer's disease with a couple of million dollars. And that professor just got a $40 million grant to look at metformin mm -hmm. for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease. We also studied a clinical trial at the Imperial College of London about five years ago, uh, which is also like semaglutide, like Ozempic, a GLP-1 agonist. Um, and showed that um, liraglutide, which was a precursor to semaglutide, actually slowed the rate of progression of Alzheimer's disease and improved glucose uh, utilization in the brain. The brain is 2% of the body weight mm -hmm. and uses 20% of the body's energy given by glucose at any particular time. So if there's glucose, res if, if insulin resistance in, uh, inhibits the ability of the brain to use glucose, you're gonna get neurodegeneration. Mm -hmm. And based on the study that we funded at the Imperial College of London, uh, Novo Nordisk, which is the manufacturer of Ozempic, is doing a th about a $3 billion study, I believe it is, of Ozempic for Alzheimer's disease. Mm -hmm. And that could be the next new breakthrough. Imagine a world where you get your amyloid removing agent in combination with a drug like Ozempic to treat the insulin resistance. And I think that's the world we're moving in. Just like other diseases of aging, you have combination therapy, mm -hmm. people characterized by their biomarkers, and they get two, three, four drugs at a time to- Cocktails. To yeah, cocktails. Cocktails, yeah. cocktails, cocktails. if you will. Um, and and that's, that's the world that we're rapidly approaching. Absolutely, and that's where artificial intelligence in each one of those studies that you've just cited is actually where AI is actually taking and utilizing that data, finding the pattern recognition, um, and then helping accelerate some of those findings uh, in that, as well as when we think about cocktails, I think this is an important one, right? We're getting to individualized medicine. Yeah. Um, and that is where the accessibility of artificial intelligence in new and inventive and novel forms um, is going to be, I think, critical in making those, um, those findings and those innovations um, in the medicine more accessible to us as a, as a public. Yeah, we just had an advisory board, board of world leaders on this issue, and it's actually more complicated than you think, mm -hmm. that we thought. Um, you know, the statistics are very complicated, the number of arms that have to go into the treatment trial. Mm -hmm. You have placebo, the one drug alone, the other drug yeah. alone, and then the combination. They're very expensive. Um, and um, we don't know which drugs to pick, actually. So, right. And the question of whether all these new drugs in combination will have to be done on a background of the monoclonal antibodies, which are quite expensive. So do we start the trial where we use the monoclonals plus the new drug, or do we use the monoclonals, get rid of the amyloid from the brain, and then start the new drug? Mm -hmm. You know, so there's, it's, it's a new, we're entering a new era, but we're not sure exactly how we're going to get there. Get quite. there, mm. yeah. So this is why those of us who love life sciences and biology and caring for people are always in awe of, of it really is almost like magic. So well, Joe, can you say one yeah, thing? go ahead. I, I just gave a speech for the, it was the first time, you know, we know that aging is the re leading risk factor for Alzheimer's disease, but there's never been a combination of studies where the, the field of gerontology, which has been around for over a hundred years, has been combined with the neuroscientists so we can learn from aging research mm. to, the, to, the, um, to the field of neuroscience for developing new drugs. You know, we talk about 100-year-olds. We funded a study up at Harvard a number of years ago, look at the risk, how many people over 100 actually had dementia? Mm. And it was approaching 50%. So, you know, one of the great things is that we're developing technologies and people are living longer, and most of them are, who live to be 100 are genetically driven. But the problem is that, 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 that this risk of dementia, the presence of dementia in that population is very high. And to, to, to make quality of life in this new world of 100-year-olds, I think, is going to be a real challenge. Great. And Joanna, we have a question from the audience for you. Are people with hearing loss who use hearing aids at lower risk for cognitive decline? Uh, the, every study seems to indicate the answer to that is yes. 